Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. So I am Mike Saunders, Hardwater Hacker on Twitter. Uh, I'm a principal security consultant for Red Siege. We're an offensive services company. Um, if you're interested in the slides, uh, you want to get them now or get them later. While it's really small, right here, redsiege.com slash WA101, you'll be able to get all the slides that uh, uh, used in the talk here. So, someone needs a beer. And when you're getting a beer, don't forget to tip your bartender. <clears throat> so disclaimer, this is a web app pen testing course, but this is not a, or a talk, but this is not a technical talk. I'm not going to be telling you like how to test for kinds of vulnerabilities. That's what you came here for, I'm sorry. I'm going to be giving you a talk about the process of web app pen testing and why that's important. So with that out of the way, uh, I can add the standard disclaimer that these views do not represent my employer, but they do because that's why I'm here, so whatever. Why? Why am I giving you this talk? How many of you are, are wanting to get into web app pen testing? You're just getting started. You don't know about the process. All right, I see some hands. Good. This is the right audience. So when I started web app pen testing, I didn't have any direction. I was basically like, here's web inspect, go forth and scan web apps. And that was all the direction I was given. So I didn't know anything about web app pen testing really, didn't have any guidance. <clears throat> and it was kind of an overwhelming thing the first time you're doing something more than web inspect, like where you're actually manually trying to test an application with burp or some other kind of proxy. And if you've ever done a test, you've probably been going through and you're, you're clicking things on the application, looking for things to test, and you see something that's juicy and you're like, ooh, ooh, shiny, shiny. And you've got to go down that rabbit hole because you, you're sure that it's SQL injection, you're sure that it's command injection, you're sure that something is there. You haven't spent the time to map out the entire application yet, but you're going down that rabbit hole because you know that when is there. And then eventually you've spent a bunch of time on that thing. It turns out to be nothing. And you've ran out of time to complete your assessment because you went down the rabbit hole. That happened to me many, many times until I got some actual training and some background. So what I'm trying to do is give you some of that background training that I got that will make you more effective in your testing and help you avoid the rabbit holes. The first thing we need to talk about when we're talking about web app pen testing is scoping. It is the single most important thing you do because it informs the entire rest of the process. The next most important thing is reporting, because if you don't have a good report, what did you do? Like, what would you say you do here? Um, but if you don't have a good scope, you're not going to have a good report. And scoping is more than just asking the client, what is the URL for your application, and are there any, uh, are there any credentials I need to use for it? It's more than that. On small apps, sometimes that's all you need, but as you start getting larger and larger applications, scoping becomes important. <clears throat> what's important to the client is what we need to figure out in the scoping process. And many times it's not going to be your traditional kinds of vulnerabilities like SQL injection, cross-site scripting, or whatever. Those are important, but that's not what the client is thinking about. The client is a business person, that says, I want to make sure that this app does what it's supposed to do and people can't make it do things it's not supposed to do. Like if you think of a traditional shopping cart vulnerability where you had this multi-stage process, you look for something, you're like, I like that thing, you add it to your cart, eventually you want to check out and you provide your shipping information, you provide your payment details, and then after you provided your payment details, it took you to a confirmation page. And there used to be shopping carts that landing on the confirmation page was kind of what triggered the whole thing to like ship your product. And so there were logic vulnerabilities that you could add something to your cart, go to checkout, give them your shipping information, and then instead of clicking next to go to the payment page, you just paste it in the URL for the verification page. And by the fact that you got there, the application thought, well, you must have paid because you're at the verification and it shipped your product. So those are the kinds of things that's probably going to be important to the client. Can you abuse logic in the application? So how do we find out what is important to them? 
talk to them about what does this app do? Um, what are the areas that you're most concerned about? What, uh, what kinds of things are you thinking are the most important in here? And sometimes they're not right, and sometimes they don't know. Sometimes you get clients that just had an auditor tell them, you need to have a pen test. And so they come to you and you're like, what, what are you looking to get out of this pen test? And they're like, auditor said we had to do this. And so then you have to decide for them what's gonna happen. So you need to work with them to understand their app. This is especially true when you're dealing <clears throat> with really large applications because your client may not have the budget to support thorough testing of the application. You run into a really large application, you're like, okay, great, we think this is going to take four weeks to test. And they're like, we only have enough budget for two weeks. And you're like, okay, what do you do now? Do you just start and test for two weeks and hope that you find the important things? Um, and budget, if you're an internal pen tester, may be budget of time. Um, I'm gonna tell you a story about when I was an internal pen tester. We had a really large application. <clears throat> and this application, it's a very large financial application, processed about a trillion dollars of transactions every year. And they came to us, they said, we, we need to have a pen test because we need to go live with this new version. Okay. And when we started asking them questions about the app, we found out it's not one app. It's really like six or seven applications wrapped up in one web application. And after getting some idea of the size and complexity of the application, my team sat down and we thought, we came up with a realistic estimate that for two, a team of two people would take four to six months to test this application. So one person is going to spend almost a year testing this. Um, four to six months, I did not want to spend that much of my life looking at one big application. The client doesn't want to wait four to six months because they have business to support. They need to get into production. So with that limitation that the client can't afford either the time or the money to do a thorough test, how do we provide some value? I mean, one approach is to just start testing and see what you find. But are you going to hit the things that have the biggest impact? Probably not. So that's what we did is we asked the client, what are the areas of the application that have the biggest Im impact? When we asked it that way, they didn't really understand what we were asking. So we asked some more questions. What does this app do? Okay, well, it processes all, it's all kinds of things related to financial transactions and processing. Who are the users? Well, it's only internal company users. There were no external users. It's not exposed to the internet, and the people that can access it have to have a special firewall rule to access it. So that means I've limited the set of potential attackers, the threat actors for this application, to most likely internal people with, who already have access to the application or have access to a machine that has access to the application. They're probably people that have, they're upset because they didn't get a promotion or uh, they didn't get the raise they thought, uh, or maybe because we can, issue we can issue payments with this app, they're people who want to steal money. It's mainly internal people. For your app, that may be a completely different set of threat actors, and you need to identify really who are the people that are most likely to, I, to target this particular application, and then what can they do with that? In this particular case, as I mentioned, it does financial transactions. So one of the things this app does, uh, we were a worldwide company, so we might get paid in rubles. But we have analysis that tells us that if we take the money out in rubles, that's great. But if we actually take the money out of the account in bolivars, there's a favorable exchange rate there. We can make more money by taking out in a different currency. So if someone's able to impact the analysis there, they cost the company money because they were able to impact the analysis. Uh, by the same token we had, when you're dealing with that kind of financial volume, leaving money in an account for a day, depending on how much is there, you can make $5,000 of interest in a day. So we have analysis that tells us when we're supposed to take money out of the account. So if I can impact that analysis, I can cost the company money. Same thing, I can issue payments to our providers. So if I can access the payment system and I'm not authorized, maybe I have access to another part of the application, but I can access the payment system, I can wire payments to an account under my control and I can steal money from the company. Once we started talking through scenarios like that with the customer, then they started to understand what we meant by what is the highest impact to the app to 
the company that this application has if it's abused. And specifically with large apps, what are the main areas of the app that have the most impact? So we said, give us a list of 10 to 20 areas in the application that have the highest impact if someone's able to abuse them. So they did that. They came back with a list of about 15 different portions of the application. Those were the areas that we focused on for our testing. We didn't test everything, and we may have missed a critical vulnerability in another part of the application. That's where they need to come back, and we talked to them about, you know, we need to circle back and do more testing on this once you get into production. But we feel this is a reasonable compromise to assess the most sensitive areas in the application before we get to production. So we've done something, and we've done it in a way that applies some analysis and intelligence to it rather than just, well, I'll log in and see where I go. So that may be, that was the case with our application. Those are the things you need to think about with your customer's applications when you're dealing with large apps. If you have access to developers and if it's a white box test where everything is really supposed to be open, uh, ask if you can talk to the developers. I have not met a developer, we hear a lot of disparaging things about developers sometimes in security. Um, just like we say a thing about users, you know. Uh, oh, users are stupid. No, we just didn't explain it to them properly. Oh, well, devs don't care. They just want to ship code. Well, they do want to ship code, but I've never met a dev when I had a chance to talk to them that didn't want to do things securely. But just like most things in IT, they weren't given the budget to do it properly or the time to do it properly, so they did the best they can. And if you have a chance to talk to them, many times they will tell you the areas of their code that keeps them up at night. Ask them, where are the things that you think I should focus on? Where are the areas that I can help you uh, either find problems or reassure you that there aren't problems in here? That's another thing to do when you're, when you're scoping, if you can talk to the devs. If you have your own development skills and you can bring code reviews to the table, ask for a copy of the source code. Take a look at the source code because that's one, going to help you find areas that you should target. And two, as you're doing your dynamic testing, you're actually in there testing things. If you think you have a vulnerability, you can go right back to the source and find out, is it actually exploitable? If you don't have that skill set, um, ask if they've done a code audit. You know, if they've run it through whatever the name is now, IBM Rational back in the day, but I don't know what it is now, something source code analysis tool. Ask if they have the results of that, something that you can see. That'll help inform your testing. Now, as important as I think scoping is, I don't want to talk about it anymore. So I'm going to talk about other things. I'm going to talk to you about what I do when I'm testing. And typically, you have a couple of phases. Even if you're doing an authenticated test, you have a portion that you do pre-authentication. What are all the areas of the site that I can see before I log in? And then what happens after authentication? In my pre-authentication phase, there's a lot of enumeration that's happening. Um, first thing I'm doing is I'm analyzing TLS configurations. Whether you use SSL scan, SSLIs, NMAPs, uh, Cypher, uh, Enum. SSL, Enum, Cyphers, I guess. So I'm using something like that. This, if you have PCI clients, they're going to want that information anyway. So I run that analysis. I'm also doing things like Nikto. It's been around a long time but it still finds common misconfigurations with web servers. It finds default content. It finds header issues that I'm going to need to report on anyway. So I'm running this up front to start getting some information about the app. I'm also going to use uh, NMAP scans at some point uh, using just basically the, if you do a TAC A or SV to get information about the app, that'll tell you some more things about the web servers that especially becomes important when you're dealing with like multiple sites, trying to understand how the, the sites are configured. And then I'm going to do DIR busting. I prefer to use GoBuster, but you can use Derby or DIRBuster or DIR search. There are other ones out there. I prefer GoBuster for speed. I'm going to talk about DIR busting a little bit more in the next slide. Um, Robots.txt. Looking in there, robots.txt is essentially telling search engines, don't index this stuff. <laughs> to me, as a pen tester, that tells me that's something they don't want in search engines. It's probably something important that I should go take a look at. So I'm going to go look in robots.txt. And if this is an internet-facing site, I highly encourage you to go to Google. Look up Google Dorking. Basically put in site, yoursite.com 
and see what comes up. If this is a new site, there's probably not much there, but if this is an app that has been in place for a while, maybe they've done an in-place upgrade on the web server, it's already been indexed. And many times when an application has been upgraded, there is legacy code that's still there in case they need to roll back. And of course, we never do things where we leave things and say, I will clean that up in a bit. We need to leave that there for now and then leave it sit there for the rest of the server's lifetime. That never happens. Um, it does. And you can find those kinds of things in Google. And now you have found a way to possibly access application logic, possibly uh, bypass authentication, or use the existing authentication you have to access code that's no longer part of the application. If you clicked through every link in the application, submitted every form, you wouldn't find this. But it's in Google and you can still reach it. And along those same lines, the Wayback Machine, archive.org. Go search for your site in archive.org and look for the old things that are out there. Um, again, you will find code that was put out there for debugging purposes, that was left over from an upgrade that hasn't been removed. You'll find that indexed in search engines. You won't find it if you're navigating through the application like a normal user, but it's still there. So take a look at those things. I mentioned that I was gonna tell you about deer busting. So I like to use GoBuster because it's fast. I can do a lot of threads. Uh, the downside to GoBuster is not recursive. So if it identifies five directories, it's gonna tell you that there's five directories, but it's not gonna do anything more. You have to manually go test every one of those. That's something where Derby will uh, recurse. Dir search will also recurse. Uh, I've heard good things about Dir search. I've found it to be, I need to do more testing. I'll say that much. I'm not sure that it's finding the things that uh, need to be there, but I encourage you to get familiar with the different tools. So if you're not familiar with deer busting, what you're doing is using a tool and taking a word list and basically requesting every one of those words in the word list and looking to see does it exist on the server or not. So it's a way to identify content uh, initially, it's going to be directories until you start adding certain file extensions on there. Um, and the way that it tells if something is on the server is based on the status code. So with uh, GoBuster, you can use TACS, and you're going to give it the status codes that res represent a successful hit. But if you're working on a site that has some type of content management system, a lot of times they will wildcard results for anything that doesn't exist to a common error page. So you'll see a 301 or a 302 to that page. So now everything the scanner requests is going to come back with a 302 so it thinks that every single thing it requested looks like it's on the server. So you can tune that out with dash S. Um, you need to provide a word list, otherwise it's not gonna do anything. I like to use the Durbuster directory list 2.3 medium or lowercase 2.3 medium. Uh, both are good lists. They're not, they're big, but there are a lot bigger words out there. Um, they're a good trade off between time and thoroughness. But there are some other word lists I would encourage you to check out. Uh, there's a guy by the name of Daniel Meisler. He's got something called Robots Disallowed. What he did is he went out to the Alexa top 1 million sites and he analyzed the robots.txt files and then basically sorted them, what are the most common things that are out there? So that's gonna help you find default, or find content on your server that may not be linked lots of times to things like admin panels, um, some of the WordPress kind of content things that you don't hit unless you're an authenticated WordPress user. Uh, but you're get, it's going to help you find content that you may not find otherwise from within the application. And along those same lines, um, he also has sec lists and he's got discovery web content. And that'll help you find specific, technology specific word lists. Like let's say you encounter a Lotus Domino server. They do exist. What are the common things that are on a Lotus Domino server? There is a Lotus Domino word list. So now I can look for certain kinds of things that might be on a Domino server that are default con content like Tomcat Manager, right? You know, we all know that on older Tomcat servers, or some of us know that on older Tomcat servers, you had the manager. And if the manager servlet was installed and they hadn't changed the passwords, boom, you're a Tomcat admin. 
It's kind of the same thing with Domino and other technologies. These are the word list to help you find that. Check for file extensions, because up at this point, we've only been checking for directories. Now, of course, if, say, you're on an IS server, you can look for .aspx or .ashx or .asp, but you might also want to look for things that are left around as part of your troubleshooting, installation, or backup processes. So .back, .txt, .log, you can add those file extensions here, and your Durbusting script is going to add a request, so if it looks for slash foo, it'll also look for slash foo.txt, slash foo.back, things like that. And you will find content that's left around as part of troubleshooting, installation, dot log is a good one for that. Getting a look at websites with different user agents can be helpful. Uh, the app may perform completely differently uh, when you look at it with a mobile user agent versus a desktop browser user agent and frequently has less security than what's in the, the full desktop version of the application. I don't know why that is, but that does happen. And pay attention to your status codes again. If you get 401, 403, that means it exists, but you can't have it. If you get a 500, it means it probably exists, but you screwed up or the server screwed up, depending on how you want to interpret it. Uh, but it might mean that the resource is there. So you, you request myserver.com slash foobar, and it gives you a 500. What that means is that either something's broken on the server, or maybe you requested that with a get request, and it only serves content when you do a post request. Or when you start getting into APIs, it may only work with put or delete. So that's something where understanding what the status codes are telling will help you understand what's on the server. So effective enumeration. When I am enumerating an application before I ever run any automated process, whether it's a scanner, it's a crawler, doing any kind of automated checks, I manually, I try to manually map out the entire application. And I do that by first running I shouldn't say that, that's a lie. I ran automated enumeration things out front, like Nikto and Durbuster and things like that. But I'm not gonna run the burps crawler, I'm not gonna run any burps scans or anything else like that. I'm gonna have my proxy open, I'm gonna feed all my traffic through my proxy, whether you're using burp or zap or something else, and I'm gonna click on every link. I'm gonna submit every form. I'm going to do that both unauthenticated and authenticated. If there's multiple roles, I want to understand what's different between the different roles. They may have different uh, capabilities. And I'm looking for things that seem interesting. I'm going to make a note of those. I usually keep that in like a one note. These are things that I need to circle back to. Those may be the rabbit holes that I was talking about earlier, but I'm not going to go down them yet. I want to take a look at all the rabbit holes and look at which ones I feel are the most likely. And then I'm also looking for things like logout links, and they may not be called logout, especially if you're dealing with an app in another, another language. I'm looking for things that have the ability to modify or delete data because I don't want any automated process tampering with application data until I know exactly what's going to happen. And there will be a story about that. So. One of the things, submitting forms, certain things are going to be straightforward. Oh, that's a phone number. Oh, that's an email address. Uh, with that large financial application, there were certain things. I'm not a finance person. I don't know what some of those terms mean. Or maybe it's looking for account numbers. And if you don't have a valid account number, you can't get to the next step. Like, OK, what's the account number you want to work with? If I don't have a valid account number, I can never get to the other things that I want to work with. So all I've done is tested the, the account number search. That's where working with the client to get what's called a good data dictionary or a script. So if we go back to that large financial application that I was telling you about, for everything that we tested, we had a script that told us, go here, click on this button, check this box, put this data in this field, put this data in this field, put this data here, click next, and so on and so forth. And that way I could fully exercise all of the logic in the application instead of just the initial form. I'm able to get all the way through it and I have good data to help me understand all the way through the process because there may be vulnerabilities in step three or four of a process, but if you can't get there, you'll never find them. So work with your client to get a good data, data dictionary. 
Now at this point, you can run the crawler, run your automated scans, but make sure you have looked for things like log out, modify, and delete. So if you're using burp or zap or whatever, put those in your exclusions list to make sure that you don't send data to those specific kinds of links. And sometimes it's based on a regex. If it's, imagine you have some type of URL that says, you know, foo and delete equals one. You know, so we're gonna delete foo. This is important to map this out because what happens if you don't, you could have an experience like I had. Now, I can't claim that I did it because I didn't, my coworker did it, um, but I was there. And we had developers come to us, they wanted us to test an application. And the easiest way to describe it is it's a bookmarking application. The developers could go in, add a link to a resource, add a description, and then the whole team could use it. It's kind of like a wiki. And it had the ability to add and modify, and of course it had the ability to delete. Now, they knew they didn't want us deleting the data out of the application, so they helpfully removed the ability to delete the application. Uh, and the way that looked is that if you looked in the source code, you would see that all the delete links were commented out. Now, if you're doing manual testing and you're looking in the responses and looking at the source, you will see a commented out delete link. And if you've ever used a good crawler, you know that it will find those things, and it's like, oh, there's a resource that I need to go investigate. Well, if your delete function doesn't have any kind of confirmation step, or even if it does, the crawler's probably going to click whatever button it can find, what happens? You delete data. So we asked, do you have backups? Yes. Have you tested your backups? Yes. Okay, that was in the scoping process. Now comes for the day of the test. We asked them, we're about to hit the big red button. Do you have backups? Yes. Have you tested your backups? Yes. All right. We hit the button, it starts. Within 60 seconds, there's the developer running down the hall screaming, stop, stop what you're doing, stop. <clears throat> the crawler helpfully visited every delete link, and they did not have backups. <laughs> so at that point, we had deleted almost all the data in the application, and they couldn't recover it. Now, part of that's on us, right? Part of that, that's on us as the security team. We ran a tool that did something we didn't understand and had bad outcome as a result of that. And I wanted to make sure that never happened to me again. I didn't know how to prevent it, but I wanted to make sure it never happened to me again. So I asked for some training, and I got a chance to go to SANS. I took SEC 542, their web app pen testing course from Kevin Johnson, Secure Ideas. And I learned some technical things in there, but the most important things I learned were about the methodology of testing. Things like always visiting every link in the application and notifying if there's anything that's gonna blow something up if we use it in a manner that we don't understand. Or just some things are gonna do irreversible damage and you need to test them, but you don't want that to happen to be the first thing in the test because now you can't work with that data or that function. Another thing that Kevin taught me was that always have two windows open when you're doing testing. One is your browser, one is your proxy. And honestly, the only thing that I use a browser for is to drive traffic to the proxy. I spend the majority of my web app testing time looking at the request and the response in the proxy. I'm only clicking in the browser to get the traffic there. And then sometimes doing visual comparison of things to see did something change as a result of what I did. <clears throat> but I'm looking in the request to see what kind of parameters are there. Are there parameters that are happening behind the scene that aren't apparent from what's happening on the page and you start realizing that there's common parameters through certain kinds of functions. So now you can understand that functions might be related because you're using this certain parameter everywhere. Um, you're looking to see what kind of data is being passed back and forth. Oh, there's hidden form fields. You don't see those, but those hidden form fields sometimes have very large impact uh, if you're able to manipulate them. And I'm looking in the responses to see what's in the response. Had I been doing this back when we ran that previous uh, test early on in my career and deleted everything, I would have seen that the delete links weren't removed, they were just commented out. I would have seen that. I probably would have known at that point that the crawler would identify it, although another reason that I manually 
follow every link and I look at all the responses is because the crawlers do not find everything all the time. They are going to miss things. Follow Tim Tomes, Landmaster53 on Twitter, and he will tell different times about you know testing with the new version of Burp, say Burp 2.0. It's, it's missing some things. And if you make assumptions about what it's going to do, you're going to miss things in your testing because the crawler will not find certain kinds of things. So that's something you need to be aware of. So we've reviewed every response, making note of anything that's out of the ordinary. Always be enumerating. So as you're doing your crawling or navigating through the application, you're going to come across a directory that your word list probably didn't cover, and so you didn't find it in your durbusting. If you find a directory that's not in your results of your durbusting, feed that back into your durbusting. Start up another durbuster run on that directory and see is there any more content underneath that that you can identify. <clears throat> Always enumerating in the background while you're doing your manual work. So, let's see. Where am I supposed to tell you about something? I'm supposed to tell you about something. Yes, I'm supposed to tell you about this on this page, sorry. Um, why am I always looking in the responses to see what's there? I will tell you. I'm testing an application that has, uh, has admin and user roles, and I have user credentials. And at first brush, it looks like a normal app. I'm, an, I'm a user, I can look at some products, I can add a product to my order, and then I can have it shipped to my business unit. Um, it's like promotional material kind of things for the company. Uh, it had other functions as well, but that's basically what the user could do. Now relying on a user browser, that's all I see. Um, that's all I'm seeing in the browser. And I did a crawl with the burp crawler, the spider. It did not find anything that looked like admin functionality. But because I'm looking in the responses, I see there is some JavaScript that basically has admin functions. It's literally called admin add user, admin modify user, admin delete user, admin add product, things like that. Those are in there, but I don't see them on the page because I'm not an admin. So I start understanding, like, why is this happening? Well, they set a cookie when you log in that says whether or not you're a user or an admin. And then the JavaScript looks at the cookie and goes, oh, you've got an admin cookie. I will give you admin access. And now that I know this, I can just make myself an admin by adding the cookie, or I can just request that link directly. Let's go to admin add user. If the application is relying completely on client-side authorization or client-side scripts to determine whether or not the user is authorized to do something, I will always win because I'm the user and I'm determining that I want to be an admin. And that's what I did here. The app, its total authentication or authorization process was let's use some JavaScript in a cookie to not tell people about admin. And because I was looking in the responses, I was able to find the admin functionality and take complete control of the application because I was looking in the responses, because Burp Spider did not find that for me. That's the importance of looking at those responses. So crawling considerations. Did you exclude sensitive functions so you don't blow up your customer's application? Burp Spider can be useful if you understand that it has some limitations and there's things you need to know about. Don't go around Peter Wintering your client. It's better now than it was a few years ago when you've been Peter Wintering your client. Um, because the default values in Burp's form submission was Peter Wiener from Wienerville, Wisconsin. It's now been changed to Peter Winter from Winterville, Wisconsin uh, with Winterville Consulting um, on one main street, Winterville, Wisconsin, blah, blah, blah. It has default values, so you need to make sure that you're putting in the right values uh, if you're going to use form submission. If you're subcontracting, this is especially important to put the right name of the company you're subbing for rather than your company if it hasn't been disclosed that you are a subcontractor to the client because all of a sudden they're like, who's Red Siege? Why are they testing our application? They're not authorized. So make sure that you're checking that, those kinds of things. Um, the Discover Content tool in Burp 
is amazing and cursed because it will find all kinds of things. Uh, it's kind of like a gigantic Durbuster plus crawler plus I don't know what kind of magic, um, but it takes forever to run. It'll find all kinds of things if you have a long time to let it run, but it will also take forever to run. So know that that tool is there and understand the, the implications. I call this forced browsing originally. It's more of an auth bypass, but if you can access a URL on an application and you don't provide any authentication information such as session cookies, if you can access it and you're allowed to have that content and it should normally be protected by authentication that's either forced browsing or authentication bypass depending on how you look at that. The way you test for that is after you've fully mapped out your application and done your crawling and all that, you have a list of every URL in the application. So go into Burp, you go to your target tab, you right click on your target and you say copy all URLs in host or in target. It'll copy every URL, paste that into a text file, use something like curl with a simple for loop and just request every URL, make sure that you're sending it through your proxy though, like this is to send it through your local burp installation. That'll now use the script to request every URL in the application, but you haven't provided any cookie values, so there's no authentication there. So after you do that, go review every response. And if the application gave you information that should have had authentication, you've got forced browsing or auth bypass. So that's an easy way to test for that which before I was manually doing it with everything in repeater and stripping out cookies and I was like, there, wait, there's a better way to do this and this is it, this is how you do it. Tips and tricks with using burp. So the intruder to target specific parameters for scanning. How many people knew that you could use the intruder to do this? You could kick off a scan from intruder. One person in the back, yeah. And before Tim Tomes told me about this last year, I had no idea. He talked about it at his DerbyCon talk last year, and I was like, what is this magic you're talking about? Let's say you normally send something to the scanner in Burp. You would scan all of these parameters. You know, you'll be, it'll be manipulating headers. <laughs> it'll manipulate every one of these parameters. But you only want to test these two. So you can use the Burp intruder, mark only those two parameters, actively scan defined insertion points, and now you are scanning only those two parameters instead of everything. It's especially useful where if there's certain parameters that get manipulated, the application logs you out, destroys your session. You can avoid that now. Um, you can rename tabs in repeater. Uh, that is a, and in other burp areas, I use it mainly in repeater. This is magic as well because before, when I'm testing an app, by the time I get done, I might have 100 different repeater tabs open for all the different things I've tested, and they're just numbered, and I don't know what they are. So I have like a OneNote that is like, there's cross-site scripting in tabs 27, 43, and 55, and SQL injection in 63. I gotta remember that, and then hope I don't delete that tab accidentally. We can just rename it. Another thing I learned from Tim, and he accidentally double-clicked on a tab name when he was trying to close the tab, and he was like, wait a second, there's a cursor there. It's because you can actually rename the tabs. It was magic. Something that, yeah, right? Like, when he did that, I was like, you've got to be kidding me. I've been testing web apps for a long time. That was amazing. So you can do that. Uh, you can use color coding in the proxy tab. You can code all your requests based on what they are and what they mean to you. If you want to have some type of organization system, color coding can be really helpful. Save you a lot of time rather than trying to keep a notepad or OneNote or whatever it is. <clears throat> There's also this concept of nested parameters. I've seen this especially in SAP applications. So, no, not SAP, PeopleSoft. It's no fun. So. Let's take a look at this here. I sent it to the intruder. Intruder automatically highlighted everything it wants to test. And we've got, you know, regular parameter equals true and nested parameter equals well, it's a bunch of stuff. I don't, I don't know what that is at first. You look at it, it's one parameter. Burp thinks the whole thing is highlighted because Burp thinks that's one parameter. But what that actually is, is nine separate parameters, one, and that's a pipe symbol, 
It's, uh, it's a URL encoded pipe symbol, so we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There's actually nine parameters in this one parameter. But burp only thinks it's one parameter because it doesn't know what to do with this. Again, using the intruder, we can just clear out what it's selected and we can manually select the individual parameters that we want to manipulate. So if you run into something like this, you can flip only the, or, or test only those specific parameters. And in this case, this application treated every one of those differently. They had different impacts. I can now do scanning based on that and target just those specific ones. So Intruder can be a very powerful ally if you know all the different things that it can do, which I'm still learning. Um, what else we got for tips and tricks? Re, uh, using macros to do session state. If you've ever had an application that just logs you out, um, sometimes because it gets mad at you for manipulating parameters, uh, sometimes it's a flaky app and it just logs you out and you have to manually go back in, log in every time. It's kind of scary the first time you do it. It's a little bit of black magic. Look at Burp's macro recorder, but there are some good blogs out there. Um, I've seen some uh, Robin Wood, Digi Ninja on Twitter. He actually has a really good blog that talks about maintaining session state with Burp, how to write a login macro. And what will happen is you, you essentially tell it, tell Burp how to recognize when it's logged out of an application. So for every request it does or every so often, it'll perform a test and determine, am I logged in or am I not logged in? If I'm not logged in, fire this macro. And this macro will replay the steps that it takes to log into the application, capture those cookies, and now use those cookies with whatever tools you've told it it applies to. So that'll help keep you logged into the application. I wrote a blog on using this with uh, SQL injection. I was trying to add a SQL injection vulnerability in an app. I'm trying to use SQL map to really feel it out, but the app keeps logging me out because it's angry that I'm doing SQL injection. And it's like, no, go away. It destroys the session. So I just proxy all the data through Burp. I wrote what's essentially a login macro to detect whether or not I'm logged in. And it goes, hey, you're logged out. You just got logged out of the application, logged back in, and that's transparent to SQL map. Get familiar with using the macro recorder. The same thing can be used to scrape cross-site request forgery tokens out of a web app when you're doing testing where there's a different token every time you view the page. And if you don't have the right token, the app says go away. It doesn't work. At that point, your automated scanning is broken. Learn how to use the cross-site request forgery uh, functionality of the macro recorder. Again, Robin Wright, uh, Digit Ninja has, or Robin Wood, Wood? I think it's Wood, has a really good blog article about that. And if you can't get your company to send you to SANS, buy the Web Application Hackers Handbook. I'm not sure how recently it's been updated. The copy that I have is a little bit older and some of the information is dated but it's still very, very relevant. The process that it talks about is still relevant. Things haven't changed, you know, fundamentally. Uh, if you had nothing else but that resource, that'll make you a much more effective pen tester uh, than, you know, just watching YouTube and whatever. Spend the time to read that book. Uh, but do go, to, do go to YouTube. Go to things like hackthebox.eu. Uh, look at various challenge networks, play in CTFs, get a chance to use those skills, whether it's damn vulnerable web app or Mutiliday or WebGoat or something like that. Practice those before you get out in the real world and find a rhythm that's comfortable to you. This is the methodology that I use, uh, but it may not be the methodology that's best for you. Something might work better. Get familiar with the constructs, start getting familiar with the tools, and that will make you far more effective than learning how to do these, you know, super cool, oh, I got this new XXE injection vulnerability. That will come along, but you might find that and miss 95% of the other things in the application because you wasted so much time if you don't have a good methodology. So spend time working on that, get familiar. Um, that's legit, it's not malicious, I promise, it's just the V card. Um, it's just going to tell you that I'm Mike at Red Siege, uh, and I'm Hardwater Hacker on Twitter. Uh, you can follow Red Siege Infosec on Twitter. <clears throat> that is uh, where we're going to be uh, 
publishing our new blogs that we write every once in a while on various kinds of research. Uh, once again, these slides are at redsiege.com slash WA101. I'll tweet them out after the uh, talk. If you have any questions, feel free to hit me up on Twitter. Uh, feel free to drop me an email. I have Red Siege stickers. They say, I am offensive, and then got our logo, that thing. Uh, so if you want some stickers, I have a bunch. Please don't make me take them home, because I have too many. So uh, with that, I want to thank all of you for being here. Thanks to the volunteers and the organizers for putting this on. Uh, thanks to our bartenders for keeping us hydrated. Don't forget to tip your bartenders. And uh, supper time. Thanks. I should ask, are there questions? Nothing, nothing going once. Questions? Yes. Um, so you spoke a lot about uh, like preventing yourself from blowing up stuff on your client server. Um, we recently, where I work, we had a pen test done for us. What we did was we provided essentially an APK that pointed out a staging environment plus permissions for a staging environment. Is something like is, is there downsides to that? So the question was about like I, I talked a lot about how to prevent blowing up your client stuff. Um, how can you prevent blowing up the client stuff? Is, is that it? Uh, no, like is there a downside to providing me as the client? Is there a oh. downside for me saying, hey, don't go to production, go to staging instead? So the question is, is there a downside with using a different environment versus using the production environment? Yes and no, and it depends on how well your environments are configured, right? In an ideal world, the only difference between dev, test, prod, stage, QA, and whatever is the data that's in them and how you access them. If you have a really good environment where that kind of stuff is uh, truth, there's no downside to testing in another environment. In fact, it's probably better because if you blow stuff up, it's okay. Uh, the sad reality is in most organizations that I've worked in, um, we've got this really beautiful setup for production and then dev or QA is some janky server that's 10 years out of date that's left over and we've got a load balancer and we've got web app, the web server here, a database server here, app server here, multi-tier architecture, and QA is like, yeah, we've got this all on this one host. So at that point, it's not a good simulation of what's in production. There's no problem in testing in that if that's what you're comfortable, you know, you don't want to risk, you know, if, when, when downtime is measured in millions of dollars a second or thousands of dollars a second, you don't want to test in prod at all if you can avoid it. But know the limitations of that. Come get stickers.